And now we have an opportunity to discuss some of the things that Fraser, Thomas, Lewis and Helen have charged us with, I guess, this morning. Michael, do you want to ask a question? Other people might like, while you're doing that, to, to put a question in the chat for next. Sure. So I, I think the question that comes to mind for me is, now we know that we've got ourselves to, uh, as I think maybe Fraser said, or maybe Helen said, the bottom of the barrel, how do we get up the barrel? What do, what do we need to do? Um, and is it just getting more funding or is there something fundamentally we need to be doing differently uh, about, about the way we're doing children for and by uh, young people and children? I might um, throw first to Fraser on that. Yeah, I guess... I would tend to say that the funding is a symptom, ironically, having just kind of lamented, but the, the funding is a symptom. It's what comes after the change of attitude. So in a way, it's about changing the attitude to the role that forming art, the arts can then place within society and within the lives of young people. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, how it will shift. I have a, a faint hope that because there, because other elements of society are also hitting a crisis point, I mean, kind of the, the bushfires were one thing that sort of seemed like a tipping point, and then it was followed by this kind of vastly greater tipping point of COVID that has made community building a key government priority and uh, a focus point for so many, uh, you know, all levels of politics. And there's a part of me that thinks that sooner or later within community building, the concept and the role that the arts play within that, because it is widely understood in society, I think it, hopefully there is an opportunity to, for it fil to filter through. How we make that happen, I'm not sure. Helen? Um, gosh, if I knew maybe 20 years down the track, I might be doing something. <laughs> have figured out an answer. I, I do think it does come down to some of the policies and the structures that are in place. I think it comes down to asking questions. Um, you know, when I raised, you know, I had a conversation with some really important people. Um, and when you talk to them about the defunding of children and youth theatre, a couple of responses have surprised me. One, they're surprised. And they don't, they don't, you know, there's a lack of visibility of the issue. Um, and I think, you know, if, if I was talking to um, the West Australian Arts Minister a few weeks ago, and, um, you know, it, it's that thing of going, I'm pretty sure Middle Australia and, and parents and are not going to argue the benefits of um, children engaging in culture and, and the arts. Um, and it does go back to that Ken Robinson quote for me, where people are just at the policy level um, and structurally, it's not built for children. The Australia Council was never set up to fund children and young people. Um, so I think a lot about that. And, and the, the dominant paradigm in the arts in Australia is for adults. You know, that's what we do in this country. We make opera and we make theatre for, for adults. Um, so I do feel very strongly about putting a lens on this where we're bringing children into the centre of cultural policy. Um, now, I haven't researched it, but I have heard on the wind that a similar thing has happened in Canada years ago, where they decided not to increase funding to major adult companies. Instead, they decided to increase funding to children and youth arts. So it is a it's a shift and it's a conscious decision that needs to be made. Um, and people need to be held accountable for their decisions, I think. I, I think perhaps as well as all of that, we're not valuing young people and children enough. So yes, the policies, yes. et cetera, reflect that. 
But I would go as far as to say there isn't enough emphasis on how important young people and children are. Mm. Uh, I, I think that's mm. something we might need to confront mm. in Australia, quite frankly. There's um, an incredible artist in Western Australia called Kylie Bracknell, who recently um, worked on Hecate, which was a Noongar production of Shakespeare um, that was done at the Perth Festival. And she made a really beautiful point to me recently, which was in Aboriginal culture or Noongar culture, children are there for, to teach us, whereas in Western culture and white culture, we're there to teach children. So I think you're right, Robin, there is a fundamental way in which we view children um, and, and childhood that makes this a little challenging. And if I were to chip in on that, I think the other thing that's tricky about it is that they're a long-term investment. But if you, if you spend time delivering programs with children and young people, you won't really get a sense of the value of that investment for 15, 20 years, potentially. And our systems at the moment are not geared for that kind of level of outcome. They need an outcome within three to five year, you know, election cycles and things. And so it's this, this kind of concept of saying that actually somehow as a society, we need to take a longer term, bigger picture approach to outcome. Mm. Um, which, and I think children are hilariously just get caught up in that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think if you, if you think about how much emphasis is put on what you can do in a multiple choice test and, and what you can see at the end of a particular lesson, instead of looking at long-term goals and outcomes, you have a big problem because some of these things cannot be measured so easily. Mm. Other questions? comments over to you guys as well i don't see anything in the chat yet there's a question from zoe um oh, do you great. think that the arts sector itself understands the value of children and young people yeah fundamentally again i would say it has been my experience as a general rule no and i would articulate that because as a company who we have a policy that you know, we need to cast within five years of the age of a character. So every artist that works with us, every director knows that there is a focus on casting young people. Yet we need to say over and over again, you have to cast as close to the age of the character as you can, because given the chance, I would suggest at least 80% of directors who understand the company's philosophy and belief when they come in, still when push comes to shove go, Oh, but that 17 year old has no experience and no training, but that 25 year old, yeah, they're a bit older, but you know, they've demonstrated their capacity. So it's a safety mechanism. It's a, it's a lack of trust. It's the risk. It's the various other things that come with valuing and taking the punt on the younger person coming through. And then I think tied into this is this really interesting thing within the performing arts and more broadly that you are not going to be a good artist until you have training and life experience and uh and it's really interesting trying to confront that constantly and saying actually some people are born really talented and by taking those really talented people and giving them an opportunity to grow and work collaboratively with adults and other people that know what they're doing they will flourish and inspire thousands of others um, you know, so there are some fundamental elements within our system that I think that have to be broken down in order for us to really believe that young people have something really strong to contribute creatively. I'd, I'd chip in from a, you know, making theatre for children and families kind of thing. Um, I remember I, I worked at Sydney Theatre Company for a long time. Um, and I remember having money and talking to a playwright about a commission and you know a commission at sydney theater company like it's an amazing company it's 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 the it's the top of the tree it's a beautiful place and the person said to me 
um, thank you so much, but I don't want to be known as a children's playwright. And they turned down a commission at Sydney Theatre Company for that reason. And so I think about that and I think, okay, so I think, yes, if you spoke to many people and said, you know, do you think the arts in the lives of children is important? Unequivocally, they would all say yes. If you asked them, um, what is their collective responsibility as funded companies towards children? I um, feel that um, they might walk away from that or, or have other things that uh, higher up the priority list. Um, maybe it's cultural diversity or whatever it is. Um, and, and so I think there are competing priorities and children's theatre and children's engagement. Um, because the business case doesn't work, it's easy to put to one side. Um, I also think that sometimes in Australia, you know, when you think about the theatre that's been made for children over the last 30 years, um, the last 15 years, there's been a real push away from theatre and education towards brilliant shows that take place in the theatre. So I do sometimes wonder if some of the, the artists today making work might have a, a, an association that theatre for children is like a TIE, it's unsophisticated, it's not interesting, so why as an artist would I want to do that? Um, whereas the encouragement needs to be um, to, to ask them for, to, to strive for something more and some of those comments I made about craftsmanship and and big themes and ideas and aesthetically rich productions. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's some of the, the things. Mm. So can I ask you another question, Robin? Of course. I know I'm being greedy here. Um, I, I think there's a real uh, tension emerging, partly from what you've said, Helen, and I know that there's uh, some of our colleagues from um, larger theatre companies on here. What's the responsibility of the kind of funded uh, theatre companies and larger theatre companies to produce support and engage work uh, from places like ATYP, Barking, Gecko, et cetera, et cetera? Should there be a more symbiotic relationship? Should there be more partnerships in that space? Um, and what should those partnerships look like? Mm. We, I've, I've had the privilege and the <laughs> life experience of um, collaborating a lot because Barking Gecko isn't funded to a level where we can actually make theatre. So we have to get money to make the shows. It's hilarious. Um, so we've done a co-production, The Rabbits, with Opera Australia. We did Storm Boy as a co-production with Sydney Theatre Company. Um, Fully Seek uh, was a co-production with Black Swan. And we regularly partner with the Perth Festival. Collaborations are tricky because um, I think the, the culture of, of two organisations coming together, together to make a piece of art is tricky. It's hard and processes and expectations and values are, are difficult. Um, up until recently, the Australia Council had a fund, which was called the Interconnections Fund, I think it was called, which was $100,000 uh, given to a major company to collaborate and co-produce something with a smaller company. I'm not sure that that is available now. Um, when I was at Sydney Theatre Company, the company had a proud history and I was very proud of the fact of um, the, the amount of commissioning that we did for children and young people. Um, I'm not sure that that's been able to continue over the last maybe five to 10 years. Um, it's always hard, Michael, I think, to impose something on someone and say, you must do this. But, and I also sometimes feel that children's theatre in our art sector, it's a little bit like the kitchen in a company where it's everybody's job to do the dishes, nobody does the dishes and the kitchen's always a mess. So on one hand, you could say it's everybody's job to engage and work towards priorities and, and, and pay attention to and engage children in theatre. The problem we've got though, is for a whole bunch of reasons, some quite legitimate, that's not happening. 
So I'm not sure that it's about going to the funded companies and the major companies. I think we do need to go back and ask the question, would we not get better outcomes if there was specific, quarantined, dedicated money and support for children's uh, and young people's theatre engagement? Because the other thing, this is, we're talking about theatre today, but the same thing that happened to youth arts also happened to youth orchestras across this country. They were cut. And so when you look across the board, um, it's, it's many art forms um, in terms of live performance. And I think that it's very, very important to also recognise that a companies like Fraser's and some of the smaller companies making work for children, we're tiny. We are tiny. Barking Gecko's turnover is about 2.5 million. Sydney Theatre Company's turnover, I think, is over a million dollars a year. So there is a massive power imbalance there. You said a million dollars a year. Did you mean a hundred million? Hundred million dollars a year. Sorry, Fraz, yes. So, you know, you're talking about powerful boards, you're talking about really important stakeholders. And unless people in positions of power are willing to give some of that up and channel it towards children, then I think we have to look beyond the arts for support. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I agree. I think sometimes we run a mistake in Australia because our industry is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We keep saying, and so the big companies need to do more and more and more. They need to be this thing and that thing. And, you know, that you need to be supporting the independent sector and the small professional sector and the youth sector. And, and I, I don't think that's the solution. I think the solution is diversity. I think the solution is more companies doing different kinds of things, not bigger mm. companies having to do more things. Mm. Um, and, and like Helen, you know, <laughs> we partner with everybody. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's really interesting in partnerships because while companies definitely have cultures and philosophies, you know, that some make them much easier to work with and some much harder, fundamentally it's it's always relying on the one or two kind of people at the core of that company that set that philosophy. And when those people change, the whole company's, a company that was wonderful to work with three years ago can be really difficult to work with again. Um, and so because that, the only thing that kind of keeps it consistent is there is a definite difference in working with a company where young people are their core business and companies where they are not. There's a really fundamental change. And unless a company, unless young people are your core business, then you do not have the values and the priorities that are the same as companies who do and, you know, in the same way of anything else. So, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would caution against uh, this idea, this pu pushing, you know, the majors to have to cover all things. I also think that we can start to look at... Um, how we think about and approach um, the First Nations culture and theatre making. You know, it would be absurd to say major performing arts companies, you must do more Indigenous work. Like we've arrived at a point where we respect the fact that um, we must have companies um, like Yuri Yarkin and, and Marageku and, and those companies who, who specialise and, and, and have a really particular way of working and lenses and... and uh, values and, and as you say, Fraser, core um, core values. And um, I feel that perhaps we could have some learnings from that in terms of children's theatre, you know, and sort of go, well, hang on a minute. Um, let's fund the specialists. Let's mm -hmm. um, uh, invest our time in, in those people and, and, and elevate them. And I, and I do think that what we, we fail to realise sometimes is, you know, there are incredible people, you know, um, I've watched Fraser work in a rehearsal room. I've watched the way that Luke Kerridge um, engages with children. You know, children are at the core of our process and we're working with children. Like Bambit's Book of Lost Stories, Luke worked with, I think, 700 children before making that show. So no wonder it was good. <laughs> um, so I, I do think that perhaps there are examples where, we, where this is, actually isn't such a strange idea. Mm. Other comments? There's a question um, in the chat from uh, 
Alison Grover Grady asking her whether there's a way to access Follow Me Home, whether there are um, excerpts or photos. Um, Fraser, do you know the answer to that question? Yeah, absolutely. There's actually a high quality recording that I'm sure I can flick you. <laughs> if you um... yeah, these are the bonuses from showing up to the OnCon Live. So you get that sort of special treatment. I should check, is Lewis still on the call? Um, but the, um, the idea with that show was that it went out as far and wide as we could get it. So we are, um, we have it, if it's not up there already, it will be soon up freely accessible on the on-demand platform, which is free to anyone that has an education login, any education email address. Um, otherwise, uh, absolutely, we'd be able to forward your details if you would be interested. Do we have a question for the group in terms of what what they're noticing? Like, is this is this is anything we've said today surprising? Um, and is there a couple of things that might be possible um, from? It's a very impressive group of people um, on the call. So I'm just wondering um, if we could ask that question to you guys. Um, just drop your ideas maybe into the chat. You know. Does your local member know that this is a problem, for example? I know it's boring, but it's kind of effective. Mm. So while, while people are putting those ideas in, um, the other question I have, and I promise this is my last question, um, the work that, that you've been doing, Fraser, at ATYP um, around engaging with community and, and what we might call applied theatre, um, is there a role for children's and youth theatre in that space? And if so, is that something that we need to be thinking more about or is it already enough? Like, is there already enough on the plate? To be working in that space, or is there, or is that something that that should should be a priority? I think I think there's, I mean, I think there's enormous potential to keep working in that space. I think the trick with it, to a certain extent, and where where I think sometimes we get a bit confused with it, is is, and this is something that often extends, I would say, across youth arts, is understanding specifically your goals and tailoring your outcomes. So one of the things that ATYP has been really successful with, with I guess our two kind of flagship projects in this area, which was a show we did a number of years ago, which won a Helpman Award called Sugarland, which we developed out of with the community in Catherine, the Northern Territory, and then working with Lewis on, on Follow Me Home. Both of them were community-based uh, projects that operated on a number of years working in consultation with young people with lived experience and using the arts as a mechanism to build trust, rapport, relationships. In the traditional process would then be about those people telling their own story and that is really valuable and really important and that has a really key place. But the kinds of work that we've been doing has been about going but there is an edge to that because those people telling when you tell your own story it has a personal truth to it that is can be really powerful it also has a vulnerability and that it's very hard to criticize some you know a work creatively if it's someone telling their own difficult story and uh and sometimes if they're not a performer, the actual quality of the delivery, as Helen was saying about quality, can suffer a little bit, can be pretty rough around the edges. So we, we engage with the work because it's important and we know that the people participating in it got a lot out of it. It's not as valuable experience sometimes for us as audiences. So what we have been looking at doing is this kind of hybrid process where we take the stories, we work with the community, we empower the community, and then we look at telling those stories with the best possible artists we can of their age that they identify with, that present them in a way that they are happy to be seen, if that makes sense. And I don't think there's as much of that work done as potentially there could be. I think we have a tendency to um, really kind of stick to putting young people on stage telling their own stories 
which can be really, really powerful. And there's an absolute place for that. Um, but I think there's opportunities to look at the way we can safely and supportively broaden what we do in that um, process drama space. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Um, Meg has a comment. It'd be good if Meg made that herself, I think. Meg Upton. She's not there. She, she was talking about the the um, relationship between um, the arts and and arts rich education, which in a sense we've touched on on the way through. But um, I think that's a really important aspect of this in terms of, of knowing that it is the more advantaged children and young people that, that do have access to an arts rich education, whether it be in school or uh, extracurricular. And it's, it's actually those who are less advantaged that aren't always having the opportunities even to go to live performance, um, et cetera. So I think, I think we haven't talked about that poverty and that disadvantage factor in all of this, but our more advantaged children and young people are going to have more access to, to arts rich education itself, but also to theatre and live performance and, and indeed to music, to the other art, to all of the other arts. Um, and it's something that our government isn't and, and policymakers aren't really ready to address. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to contemplate what that lever for change will be. Um, mm -hmm. I, back in the 1600s, uh, did a primary teaching degree. Um, we used things like chalk. And it, when I was doing my study, um, we had two semesters of um, arts. Um, we didn't do dance because dance was in phys ed. Um, but the teachers coming through now, and, and, and there's a younger generation of teachers who um, kind of don't have it at school, uh, sorry, as part of their teaching. And so we've got teachers coming out into schools who don't access and engage in the arts. We've got um, barriers to children engaging in it. Um, we've got problems in the arts sector being defunded. Do you know what I mean? Like there's this perfect storm of why um, this is a bit of a problem because um, it's either going to be a parent or a teacher that brings children to the theatre. Um, so... Yeah, I do think it's it's a bit of a broad kind of systemic issue to have a have a think about. Mm. And what we do is fun. Oh my gosh, it's the magic business, you know. Like, I mean, I'm sure many of you know this, but you can go to a theatre show. And I remember once I went to a theatre show, and there was some quite important people that nodded off, and then they gave the thing a standing ovation. Um, and then at the same time, um, there was a bunch of children who were really bored and misbehaved in a school matinee, which is terrifying. If you've got 200 bored children, um, they can go really feral, but I love that honesty. Um, and, you know, but then you look at um, 300 children sitting in and watching Bambit's Book of Lots stories. You think they're at a rock concert, like they are so unruly, it's brilliant. Um, and, you know, the best thing you can do to get a donor to give you money is just get them to bear witness to what happens to children when they see a show. Don't worry about the show. <laughs> Watch the children um, and, and the proof is right in front of you. Kaylee, why don't you make your comment? I think that's a really important one too. Uh, I was just reflecting on... Um, kind of personal situations, I guess, where I have seen intimidated adults when I've, you know, brought some teenagers into certain situations and some even older adults saying like, oh, I don't know, I don't know what to say to, 
say to those teenagers? Like, what should I say? And I think it's um, so important for us to reconnect to our teenage selves in those moments. Um, I started out of a lot of my Sydney journey. I'm, I'm from regional area with ATYP and ATYP absolutely gave me the confidence to feel like I could be a part of the industry in Sydney um, and now working at Sydney Theatre Company. And whenever I work with teenagers, I think about that and, and want to elevate them. Um, so I guess it's more analysing that resistance um, to some people as to why they find it threatening a little bit. Not sure. Yeah. Mm. Have I opened a can of worms now? <laughs> yeah. We, um, up until very recently, sort of right in the middle of a research project that I'm doing um, with an incredible man called Bob Harlow, who is a, you know, he's a statistician with degrees from Princeton. So, you know, clearly an arts researcher. Um, he is talking to audiences um, of parents who come and don't come uh, bring their children to the theatre and if not why and talking to teachers a lot about why they come and why they don't come and what we've noticed with some of the teachers and this research um, has not been finished yet there's not is not completed but teachers um, are so important um, in you know one teacher can bring 200 children to a theatre you know it's it's wonderful um, teachers either view their role as teachers and the facilitation of an excursion because it's something really great. It's something that they just should do as, as, and, and provide that experience for their children. The other cohort of teachers that we've been talking to, it's very tied to curriculum and content. So we have these two notions almost of what your job is as a teacher and how you see your role as a teacher. And if you see your role as providing some of these broader opportunities, and that's why you take kids to the theatre, um, they'll come. But if you see it as this is a show about something, then, um, yeah, it, 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 let alone the fact whether or not they've ever been to the theatre before themselves, because that's quite terrifying to take children to the theatre if you actually don't know that experience yourself. So they were some of the, the early reflections that we, mm. we were hearing. I guess we found that one of the things that's fascinated me over the last 10 years, because everyone assumes when ATYP does a show and when we used to contact companies about partnerships, they always used to put us in touch with their education department. But actually, schools don't come to our shows as a rule. They're not our biggest audience. Our biggest audience are, you know, GP and parents and, and, and friends and... Um, uh, and it's because schools tend to need, particularly high schools, do exercises on what's on the curriculum. The curriculum deals with um, generally shows driven by adult protagonists that are produced by adult theatre companies. Our work, because it's always driven by uh, a young protagonist and looks at the world through young people's eyes, there's not a huge amount of work specifically written in that kind of context. So we create a lot of new work ourselves, which doesn't fit easily into any of the curriculums. So to a certain extent, we've kind of just, it's taken a while to go, actually, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and we'll let school sooner or later, we'll kind of catch up hopefully to us or jump on our train rather than us trying to jump on a school train. Because the truth is we will never get the 25,000 people that will go and see Romeo and Juliet by Bill Shakespeare's touring production to one of our new works that we're premiering. Um, but if we can continue to kind of chug down this way and, and build kind of confidence and, and in particular, as Helen says, quality, then sooner or later others will join us. But it is an interest, it's always fascinated me that it's such an interesting dis, um, disconnect. It's an irony, of course, in you mentioning Romeo and Juliet, Fraser, because of course they were both children, really. And, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that's a fabulous point uh, on which to 
kind of finish this conversation. And hopefully it will be a conversation, the first conversation, well, it's not the first conversation in this area, but one of many conversations that are sprouted from this work. Uh, and I want to thank Fraser, I want to thank Helen, uh, and I want to thank Lewis for such a fantastically provocative, interesting, um, and I think hopeful, in the end, hopeful piece piece of discussion around these issues because, and I think uh, where Fraser finished is really where we need to start, putting the young people and the children at the centre of the discussion. Um, just so you know, the CREATE Centre is working on uh, some work uh, on in the impact of theatre on young people um, and helping companies to uh, do, do a really good and holistic job using the arts and other measures to understand that impact. If anyone's uh, got any interest in that, please drop Robin, myself or Thomas a line. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of the discussion. It's not all of the discussion. But one of the really hopeful things that I'm seeing in the chat and in this general discussion is a real recognition that there are things that we can do and there are things that we should be doing in connecting all of the different sectors, uh, the people in schools, people in theatre companies, uh, to really kind of make the argument that this work matters and will continue to matter for a world that is becoming a little bit adrift from its stories. So thank you, Helen. Thank you, Fraser, uh, for being, and Lewis for being such fantastic contributors today. And thank you, everybody, who's come from all over the world and all over Australia to um, mm. be part of this. Please, um, please uh, be part of uh, Create, sign up for more information uh, if you'd like and to get our e-news and uh, Thomas can drop that in the, in the Zoom message, message thing, whatever that's called. Um, but thank you so much for your involvement today. It's been wonderful to have you all on and all the best for uh, the rest of the day and, um, and the rest of the week. Thanks very much.